So in the early days of social cognition, people used essentially the same paradigms that they used in traditional experimental psychology. And this basically means taking your volunteer, putting them in a small room by themselves and telling them to do things like pressing a button every time the light comes on. And this was sort of taken over into social cognition. So you take your volunteer, you put them in a small room and you tell them to press a button every time they see a fearful face or something like that. And it became apparent to many of us that this was actually missing out most of social cognition. Because in real life, we're not sitting in a room all by ourselves. We're interacting like with me talking to you in this interview or this conversation at the moment. And um, we needed new paradigms so that we could actually study people interacting in real time in the lab. I was very fortunate that at this time I started collaborating with a group in Denmark who actually are called the Interacting Mind Centre, where they do experiments of this kind. And um, one experiment we did was again to take an absolutely classic experimental paradigm that you would typically do with one person, but do it with two people. It's too expensive to have more than two people. Um, and this is a psychophysics paradigm. That means to say you present a visual stimuli, which is very difficult to see, and you can manipulate it in various ways. And you basically you ask people, did you see the stimulus or what stimulus did you see? And it's an extremely boring task where you have to have hundreds of trials. It goes on and on and on in this dark room. Um, but if so, we changed this and we had two people. So you have two people working together. They both see the stimulus, which is hard to see. And they each independently says, did you did I see it or not? If they disagree, or perhaps did I see X or did I see Y? If they disagree, they then have a discussion and come up with a joint answer. Now, interestingly, this paradigm, instead of being extremely boring, people actually like doing it. And it turns out that discussion is critical. So there are two things that we found. First of all, the joint decision was better than the best person working on their own. So there was an advantage from having two heads really were better than one. And the reason for the advantage was that they had this discussion. If they weren't allowed to discuss, you didn't get the advantage. And what they discussed was how confident they were. So the reason that two heads are better than one in this situation is that in a task like this, you constantly have fluctuations in your attention. So sometimes you were not watching closely enough. But this is unlikely to happen to both people at the same time. So they can find out on each trial which one was attending more, which one was more confident in their answer, and you take that answer, you get a better result. So that's one example of doing experiments where you have two people rather than one. Another very simple paradigm that we developed with Ivana Konvalinka was where two people have to tap together in synchrony. Very, very simple task. And um, the way this works is that they hear a rhythm for some eight beats and then they have to start tapping together. And so they have two things they have to do. They have to keep the rhythm and they have to keep in synchrony. And we had different ways in which it was a set up. So one way they hear the rhythm, but they don't hear each other. So they rapidly drift apart. Another case, A hears B, but B doesn't hear A. So essentially what happens is that B keeps the rhythm and A synchronizes. But the most interesting one is where A hears B and B hears A. So they're, they're now hearing each other and they actually synchronize even better. But the interesting thing is when you looked at the detail of how they synchronize, 
because they're tapping, say, every half second or quicker. So you're measuring their tap into tap intervals in milliseconds. And what you find is that they're constantly mutually adapting to each other. So if I'm doing it with you, if I was slower on the last trial, I will speed up. But of course, you on the last trial, because I was slower, you were faster, so you will slow down. So if you look at the correlation across people, it's actually negative because I'm constantly speeding up as you slow down and vice versa. But because we're continuously adapting, we keep in synchrony. And this is different from the situation where A hears B, but B doesn't hear A, because in that case, one of them just has to follow the other. So the person who doesn't hear the other can't adapt. So the other one is doing the adaptation. So the nice thing is that when they hear each other, you sort of get two hyper followers who are constantly adapting to each other. And we believe that this is an important principle of social interactions. This is obviously a very simple task that you can do in the lab. But we also adapt, for example, in the task I previously described where we're talking about confidence to each other. The problem here is that I can sometimes be overconfident or underconfident. And again, we have to adapt our confidences to make sure that one of us is not always overconfident and therefore misleading us. So you get exactly the same mutual adaption. I become more confident if I was right on the last trial and you were wrong and you become slightly underconfident. So this mutual adaptation seems to be a very important aspect of social interactions. Another interesting aspect of these social interactions is when we play competitive games. And a very simple game is what I call matching pennies. So this is where I have a penny in one of my hands and you have to guess which one it's in. And you can have two people competing in this task. And my colleague Jean Donizot in Paris has been looking at this task intensively and has developed some very clever computerized um, models of how this works. But you can see how the, you can think about this in terms of learning. I have to learn which penny you're going to hide the hand you're going to hide the penny in. If I was a simple association learning device of the kind that Pavlov talked about, I could learn that it's usually on the right. And I would say right until I, it turned out it was now usually on the left. And I, so this is a very simple learning device that is not thinking about you at all. It's thinking about simply where has the penny been in the past? But you can have a more complicated learning device which is thinking where, which side does he prefer? And you could learn that, which is slightly more complicated. But then it gets really sophisticated when you say, which side does he think I'm going to put the penny in? And then you can go even deeper than that. This is called recursion. You can say, which side does he think that I think that he thinks is going to put the penny in? And Jean Denizot and his PhD student could actually write a computer program where the computer will do this recursion to level of two. So you, have, you can have real people, or at least French people, playing against computers with different levels of recursion. And it turns out, and you can measure, and you can also work out what strategy the people are using. When they think they're playing against a person, they will also use these recursive strategies. And they go up to about a recursion level of two because it, beyond that, it becomes cognitively just too hard. And they can, so they can beat a computer that has a recursion level of one. And they will draw with a computer that has a recursion level of two. But what is interesting is if they believe they're playing against a robot, in fact, they're told there are these two one-armed bandits which can give you different rewards and you have to choose which one. On. So the task is identical but they think they're playing against a machine and then they don't use recursion and they're actually beaten by the computer. Another version of this recursion that I'm rather fond of is something called the beauty contest game. This now involves not just two people, but lots and lots of people. 
It was invented by John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist, and relates to the stock market, basically. So it's called beauty contest because the idea is you have to predict, you don't have to predict which is the most beautiful person. You have to predict which is the person that people think is the most beautiful person which is obviously very important in the stock market because you don't have to know how valuable the stock is. You have to know how valuable people think the stock is because that's what determines it, whether it's going up or down. So the beauty contest game is very simple. You say, think of a number between one and a hundred and the winner is the person who's close to half the average number guessed. And you can see how the recursion comes in. If you're a complete idiot, you think of a number between 1 and 100 randomly, it will be 50. So if everybody else is a complete idiot, you will say 25, which is a recursion of 1. If you, th if you think there are quite a lot of people here who are clever, then you will say 12 and a half or whatever. If you've been taught about the Nash equilibrium from economic game theory, you will say 1 and you will lose because people aren't all super rational. And in fact, people have, this, is, this game has been run in newspapers, so you get thousands of responses. And again, it shows that the average level of human recursion is somewhere between one and two. So this is a, this is a practical value because I managed to win a very large chocolate bar by winning this battle of the sexes when they opened the Denmark Behavioral Imaging Lab. <laughs> But this, I guess, what I hope I'm putting across is there are all sorts of exciting things happen when we start in studying interacting minds. We're at a very early stage yet, but we have discovered quite a few interesting features of interacting minds, like the mutual adaptation, which seems to be critical at all sorts of levels of cooperation, the recursion, which seems to be important when we're in competitive situations, and I think this is of vital importance if we really want to understand how human interactions work in real life, in society, in politics, and of course, in the interactions between nations. <laughs>